please join me in prayer as we prepare to hear the word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, move in us today. Silence the many voices of this world that compete for our attention so that we would hear only your voice, the voice of your love and your grace. Be with us, open us up. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gospel reading for today comes from John's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. It's found on page 115 of the New Testament in your pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. Listen now for the word of God. After these things, Jesus showed himself to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. Jesus said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to him, Follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How is it that we recognize our friends and our family? When we look at people, how do we know that they are the ones that we know? And if their appearance was changed, what are the telltale signs? 
I think of when I'm in a crowd of toddlers, how I know my own daughters cry from habitual hearing of it. I can pick it out without even seeing that it's her. I think too of, you know, we have a pair of twins here, they're not here today. And finally, I have figured out, just by looking at them, which one is which. So there's something about repeated familiarity that shows us who people are. And in this time after Jesus' resurrection, I think we take it for granted that he looked like himself. But who really knows what he looked like? There are repeated stories of Jesus appearing and the disciples not knowing that it was him. There's another story of a post-resurrection appearance, and it comes from Luke's Gospel. It's one of my favorites. Jesus appeared to some disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, and they also did not know that it was Jesus. But it was when he ate with them, and he took the bread and broke it, that their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. In our story today from John's Gospel, the fishing disciples also did not recognize that it was Jesus standing there on the lake shore. They had been fishing all night and had caught nothing. And I imagine they were feeling both fatigued in a physical sense and weary down to their souls. Jesus was gone, and while they had seen him resurrected, still, can you imagine what it must have been like to think about, what do we do now? We who are left here and somehow are now supposed to be the leaders of this Jesus movement. And so maybe it was their desperation that opened them to listen to this strange man on the lakeshore who said to them, just put the net on the other side. They had been out all night, and so surely they had done that. But they did not argue with Jesus, didn't say, we've already tried that, or who are you, what do you know, or that's a silly idea. But they do it and they are overwhelmed with the haul of fish. And it is that moment, that is the thing that points to them as this is Jesus. Because then the beloved disciple declares, it is the Lord. They recognize Jesus in the abundance of fish. fish so many fish that the net was straining. It says 153 fish. That probably wouldn't be a lot by today's industrial fishing standards, but for a group of guys with a basic net back in those days, it probably was a lot. Certainly more than they could eat or share with people in one day's haul. Jesus provides a miraculous amount, and that is the sign that this is Jesus. Because Jesus reminds them right up until the end that his ministry is about abundance and grace and overflowing love. John's gospel is a unique gospel. And in John, it throughout, he mentions abundance and points to Jesus' miraculous signs. Now, the famous first chapter of John, which is known as the prologue, where we hear, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, John writes in verse 16 of that first chapter, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And the very last verse of John's gospel, the last verse of the chapter that we've read from today, but we didn't get to the last verse, is this really interesting little comment. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that were written. And one of my favorite verses in all of scripture also comes from John's gospel. John 10:10. 10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is about grace upon grace, abundant life. Of water turned into wine earlier, also in John's gospel. And the miracle happened at the end of the wedding and there was plenty of wine left over. And then we get resurrection, grace upon grace. 
God loves the world truly and came to save it. And in that grace, we see and know that God is a God of abundance. That's how we see and know that God is God and Jesus truly is present when we can't see him in physical form. So on the lakeshore that day, Jesus showed himself. That was from the first verse. He showed himself. He went there to remind them of who they are and what they were called to do. And that reminder is that love is abundant and that grace overflows. So he gives them fish and then he makes them a meal and says, come and eat. It's amazing, isn't it? The fish and the provision that God puts in our lives. But grace is a hard thing to fathom. What about grace for people we don't like? What about grace for the parts of ourselves that we don't like? What about grace in this world that so often seems to be falling to pieces? From mass shooters who twist faith to serve violent ideology, to the early death of loved ones, to dev devastating illnesses and never-ending social problems, life can make us wonder what really is grace, and is it for me? Is it really real? Sure, Jesus back in the day gave them a bunch of fish, but what about now? It's hard to hold on to and hard to see. And thinking about this story, I was thinking about my own experiences with fishing. When I was maybe four or five, my family and I visited my grandparents in Florida. And one day, I was fishing off the dock to the bay that connected to the ocean. And I had one of those simple, um, I think a bamboo fishing poles. So it was basically just a stick with a line and a hook. And I was waiting and waiting, so excited to get my first fish. And then suddenly, I felt that tug and knew something was happening. But I freaked out and started screaming and let go of the fishing pole. So off went the fish and the fishing pole, never to be seen again. And I'm not sure that I ever recovered um, from that incident and have never become a fisher person. So I was surprised and I was unprepared. And I think grace is a surprise that's hard to hold on to like that. Those disciples that day had that miraculous catch of fish and I'm sure it didn't make sense to them, but they went with it. There was so much. And like the catch that day, grace doesn't make sense in our world either. How are we supposed to see it and hold on to it? What even is grace? To me, grace is an overflow of love, like those fish straining that net. Where are the fish overflowing in your life? I think of love and forgiveness and mercy, of serving and being served, of people who've shown up in my life when they didn't have to, people who went out of the way to say that they care and to offer help. In the Sunday school this morning, you heard that they already heard the story, and. They did an interesting exercise. It was called a monk's meal. And the instructions were that there was food on the table, but they could not feed themselves, and they could not talk, and they could not make gestures about what food they wanted. So basically, if you wanted to eat or have other people feed you, you had to feed someone else. Now, I haven't heard a full report of how this went with our um, wonderful and bright children, um, but I did hear one of them said, this is hard and I don't like it. <laughs> Grace is like that. It pulls us in in its amazingness, but it kind of scares us with how difficult it really can be to encounter another. Because when I've received grace in my own life, it's amazing, but it's also a little scary. 
It reminds me, too, of Peter, who we heard in this story. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus and Peter kept saying, yes, yes, I do. You know that. It calls to mind the three times that Peter denied following Jesus. Peter must have been down in the dumps feeling shame and fear. But Jesus doesn't mention any of that, but instead calls him to get back in the track of discipleship. And from there, Jesus beca or Peter became the rock on which the church was built. That is grace and that is mercy. And that grace is what we have in our lives. I wonder where you've seen it. I hope that you have. No matter what we've done, no matter our failures, our lack of action, our apathy, no matter who we've hurt, God offers us to, again and again so much fish that we don't even know what to do with it all. Grace is the language that God speaks to us again and again. Wherever we see grace, we know that there is Christ. And Jesus catches us fish again and again, and he says to us, look and bring it in. Grace is real, and it is for us. So friends, hold on to it, because the net will not break. And when it gets hard to hold on, as it inevitably will, Jesus keeps saying, come and have breakfast. <laughs>